Welcome to the Scott McGlynn Show podcast. Please welcome your host. It's Scott McGlynn. Welcome back to the Scott McGlynn Show, guys. And today I have Matt Fadets. How are you doing? I'm great, Scott. How are you? I'm very well. How How is life at the minute? How is the family? How is this lockdown situation for you? Well, we're all good. Obviously, it's been very strange times for all of us. And we've, we've had to, for me, I've had to work harder than I've ever worked since I started off my business when I was 17. But the um, the good thing is all the families are healthy. We're in a nice, safe place. And um, light at the end of the tunnel now for all of us, isn't it? Things are going in the right direction. So that's mm-hmm. a good thing. How's things with you? Yes, very well. Um, like you said, I think I think like the, at the start, though, you know, I was very chilled, very relaxed. And just think, oh, my God, I'm just going to have a couple of weeks off. Fantastic. And then that was bought, like... <laughs> 12 13 weeks ago i'm like okay maybe it's just like good to get back to normality and stuff but um yeah it's yeah it's, it's, it was nice get to see start. some people make friends for a change exactly that'd be nice wouldn't it yes and I, I think um you know when things it's obviously taken away from us i think we've just taken it for granted a lot and now i would never take like a bar for granted in my life <laughs> you know, i keep saying so i'm never gonna are going to complain about a foreign holiday again, a restaurant again. I'll take whatever's whatever's coming. Yeah, a, a supermarket. I'll we'll never take that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me. And um, for any listeners out there, uh, and I'm very excited to get you on, Matt, because out of like, I think this is like my 99th episode of a guest on this show. Um, wow. I've never had someone like you on here so i'm very excited um to have you on Privileged, oh, you are. actually is that because of my bizarre life yes and uh, <laughs> we're gonna deep the cheat listeners we're gonna just dive right in and we're gonna get from the beginning and we're gonna come to the present but you're um well you're well known as and people known you for like a celebrity bodyguard but obviously the martial arts the fitness you you know you do that's your area isn't it yeah, that, that, that's, what, that's what I do before all the craziness began. You know, when I was 16, I opened up my first martial arts schools and then learned to franchise it all around the world. And we've got over about 1,018 locations okay. currently. So they're all being taught online now, as you can imagine, through through live platforms and stuff until we can get back to normal. But mm. um, that's, that's my main career, yeah. All the other stuff just kind of came as a added bonus. I, I think mean, like, it's a bit of a fair tale, isn't it? Yeah, like how... Because obviously I've, I've done my research, I've read up so much about you, Matt. Um, so, like, when you... I can't believe, like, as that age, 16, because that is, like, young, and you had £100 in your pocket, right? That was... That's just... That's all you had. And you opened your first school for yeah. martial arts. You have done your research. Yes. Um, like, that's... like. How, what year was that? Like, what year did you do that? That was in um, the £100 thing. That was actually in... So, first of all, I remember going into the bank in 96, and I spoke to um, the business manager there, and she said, well, I had my vision what I wanted to do, but no one's ever done it before. I teach martial arts as a, a career. So she said, you need to have some money to open an account. So I worked out as a lifeguard at a local ledger centre for £2.75 an hour, and I opened up the business account of a hundred pound, and then um, it just went from there. So that was ninety seven, right. um, when it when it really it took off, and then by by literally like mid ninety eight, it was the the biggest martial arts school in um, the UK without a shadow of a doubt. It was two floors and seven eight hundred members training a week, and a little town called Barnstable in North Devon. And it was quite strange. There's only 20,000 people in the town. So it became really like a phenomenon. People just couldn't understand what this young guy was doing with this uh, 
with his school. And then everyone else tried to look on it then. We had all the big names look, come and take a trip down and see what I was doing differently to them. And then the martial arts media would put me on the front cover. And then um, what happened then, really, Scott, is we had these, these like news agencies. They don't, they don't exist so much anymore. Yeah. Um, they got word of what I was doing. They came in, did some figures, and realized I was doing very well financially. And I was so young. And they they said, look, do you mind doing an interview? And I just thought it would be like for a local newspaper. I was yeah. quite happy to get that. And um, I got bullied at school. That's what made me do martial arts. So they interviewed me, took some pictures, and I said, so he's going to make the local use, newspaper? And they said, yeah, without a doubt. Well, two days later, it was literally the front page of every national paper. It was, Buddy Boy Becomes Millionaire. And then I was on TV shows like um, Trisha and um, Kilroy. You're probably a bit young to remember them, but they're like, they're like talk shows, morning talk shows, really. A bit like um, the one that just got axed, uh, Jeremy Cole, but Karma. Yeah. Karma. And uh, so I went on all these TV shows and morning TV. And that's how the, kind of the show busy side started off. So it's all from the success of that first martial arts school, really, which I, I managed to franchise out over and over and over again. So it just came from a dream at school when I was 12 years old. Sat, I was learning maths and I just didn't get very on very well academically. My mum was a lawyer and she's one of 14 children and all of her brothers and sisters have, have got university degrees and things and they wanted me to be a vet or something so when they heard they wanted to be a martial artist was, they were very disappointed and didn't think it was going to happen my granddad wanted me to get a trade like the family have done like an uh, electrician or be a plumber he used to say you know Matt how, how are you going to make any money like kicking your legs about in the air come on get realistic <laughs> and uh, yeah he had his words back a few years later and um, became very proud of what he succeeded but it just came from a being sat in a maths class, I wrote all these goals on the back of the, you call them exercise books, don't you, back then, and where you're taking notes and things. And, mm, and yeah. it was just a list of goals. Like I wanted to be a fourth degree black bar by a certain age. I wanted to be the most successful martial arts school owner in the world. And I had all these lists of goals. And I achieved them all by the time I was 21. It was quite amazing, really. So it just shows you like, the power of thought, positive thinking, and law of attraction I, I really believe in that stuff so no qualification at all I just left school with nothing apart from my black belt that was it really yeah I I, I believe in a law yeah. in attraction is that I am with you on that I think um like positive energy you know and I I always go like a do like a list of things I want to do um you know I just have to work through them you know so I'm definitely with you on that and I believe exactly what you're saying about um yeah, just it, it's pretty much it was a dream you had, really, and your dream come reality. And yeah, you know, whatever you whatever you believe, Scott, you can conceive. And I really, I really, uh, I really believe in that. You know, we we say to all my team, you, you dream it, believe it, achieve it. We have to always have a goal to work towards and a plan in place. And it doesn't have to be financial; it could be physical fitness or relationship goals or whatever, whatever it may be. But it always works. You put a plan in place, and you. They, they say if you, if you fail to plan, then plan to fail. You know, you got to have that plan in place. And even now, I have a five-year plan that I keep readjusting to get to my next stage where I want to be in. It's, it keeps you positive. It keeps you growing. And that, yeah. that's, that, that's the goal here, really. So, Absolutely. And so our interest, um, I, martial arts. So um, p- person like me, I did dabble in taekwondo when I was growing up. I, I got to, I think, maybe green ends, yellow ends from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, um like so what what are you trained in like martial arts because obviously it's so many different things right it's uh, changed a lot it's like, i'm taekwondo as well scott so i'm a seventh oh, degree yeah. belt in in taekwondo um but yeah you're right over the years people expect more so you don't just teach a taekwondo syllabus now if you want to be successful so you incorporate other different styles into into it but the qualifications they do get is in in taekwondo that's my Oh. my background since i was seven years old and um yeah that's what they get their their black belts and their dan grades in yeah. but um so we make it more family orientated but people join mainly because they want their children to learn how to be more disciplined respectful how to set goals it's not so much the kicking and punching that's the hook that gets them excited mm. it's education so we, we don't class ourselves as clubs we're schools we're like private schools the kids get homework they get tasks they got get their bedroom tidy they've got a job sheet they've got to do per month and 
if they don't complete them, they're not allowed to go for the next color bout grade. So we're we're like an academic school, and we've always operated like that. And I think that's why we've been so successful, even in times like now where most martial arts schools are collapsing because they've classed themselves as sport as a club where parents put value on us because we're education. Yes, yeah. And I actually, know, you know what? It was quite a long time ago when I was in high school, the start of high school, that's when I did it. But now that you're saying it, I do remember when I actually go went for an upgrade. You, I, you had to, I don't know if it was the numbers or you have to like read something. Um, I, I don't know what language, Korean, I think maybe. Korean, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, uh, Taekwondo. Yeah, it's like one of those Korean martial arts. Yeah, I remember you had to like speak or maybe do the number. It was something like that, and um, it was on stage. Yeah, God. that's right. We had Hannah Dool set there. That's just that's right. That'd be all the yeah. We we come away from that. I was one of the first to do that, Scott, because you know we're in England and um, you want to provide them the family with a family experience. So we I abolished counting in Korean and all the Korean names and and, and turned it into English. And then we did things like putting music on in lessons to make it more... It's like trying to work out in a gym without music. It's very difficult. You put music on, you've got a bit more of a buzz about you. Yes. Your things going. So it's the same with martial arts. So we, we ditched the old way of doing things and brought it to a modern era. And I, I got some stick from doing that. I was one of the first to do that. And it, and it was unheard of. But clearly, it's what the public wanted. Otherwise, we would never have been 24 years later, still growing and growing and growing. So yeah. it was a big move back then. And we um, took a lot of abuse about it because people don't like change. No, it's yeah. actually things that have been around for thousands of years, but it's what the public clearly wanted. It was the best thing we did. Now they're all doing it. Now everybody does it. And at times like this, the old school people are looking to me for advice on how they can survive and get through this pandemic, you know, with their, with their martial arts schools. Mm. But, um, yeah, it's, it's all about education. That's the key. That's yeah. the key. Parents want their kids to have a positive role model. So they, they want you to represent what they want their children to grow up to be one day. Because it, it's been, obviously, I don't want to put an age on you, Matt, my love, but like, just because it's been like a decade, obviously, it's been a bit longer. Have you found it's changed, like obviously in young people today, because obviously the life is just completely different with like technology and just stuff like, you know, phones and games and stuff like so do you think that's changed since when you started all the kids coming to you then and, so, and now? Yeah, it's a massive change. And yeah. I won't worry about my age, Scott, because <laughs> they're going to find me in Google. I was turned 41 um, in May, so ah. I, don't, I don't look it, but that's thanks to an amazing Botox uh, doctor. And uh, so <laughs> all my cracks are starting to appear now because I think there's a lot of people in my situation right now, but... <laughs> But no, yeah, it's totally changed because back then we never had such a thing as like internet bullying. Whereas nowadays, like I have to make a call to someone after I've done this interview who's who's a very well known public figure who's being cyber attacked, cyber stalked, cyber bullying, and that's what goes on. And a lot of my celebrity friends who I hang out hang out with and help out are not having problems with people in the street anymore. It's online, it's uh, Instagram, and the abuse, the trolls, and you know, you have to talk about what happened to Caroline Flack to see how serious it is, you know, and um, yeah. so it is changed massively. We, we've had to rewrite everything. So back then, we had no such thing. It was just MySpace. There was no Facebook. Email was just coming about. There was no such thing as cyberbullying and trolls and stuff. Now we've got a whole different department that literally deals with that and educational stuff that we teach the kids and and blockers and location devices they've got to learn how to use and to turn off and so on and educate the parents and the dangers of all these different things. And um, so, yeah, it's trying to protect the children on a whole different level, which is growing so fast, especially now, more than times, especially in COVID-19. I mean, everybody like doing Zoom calls has become the normal way of meeting people. I don't think life will be the same at all. And TikTok has grown huge. <laughs> and... Um, it's uh, and unfortunately the downside to that is you've got I don't like to say it but you you, you know you got the, the pedophiles or people and stuff who are going to be crawling through nice. access children through these uh, new platforms and parents need to be aware on how to block them and how to be able to you know make sure their kids are looked after and not talking to the, someone they think's a friend of theirs but is actually a grown 
grown man or grown woman. You just don't know, you know. Mm, so so I, it's a serious situation right now. Are you, are you a TikTok fan? Do you have it? Yeah, I, I have it. I, I did it for a laugh and at the start of t- uh, start of lockdown. Right. But my wife does it more so than me. I, I don't get the time, Scott, to do it. I, I do get a big reaction when I do it. People like to see me doing normal, funny things. But some of the stuff on there is it's hard wearing two hats. You've got to be like a role model as master finesse from the martial arts schools and then and then doing some crazy stuff on TikTok. It's like a head teacher trying to do it. It's a real hard balancing act for me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I've done a few videos and stuff. My, my, my wife's got quite a following on that. She does. A, she's a singer and she does a lot of stuff on there and things. But Instagram, I think that that's that's you know that seems to be changing a lot now. I've noticed. Mm. And um, competitors, isn't it? You know, it's, they got to keep up with the other ones. You know, so uh, they have. They yeah. really have. Yeah. yeah this is. Uh, Touching back on like you said about um, you got celebrity clients and I know uh, you because you take these celebrity clients on and then you teach them about um, obviously online protection, yeah, uh, and physical, you're yeah, and in person, not just online. But um, it's so interesting when I was reading about this and you when you do it, I'm like that is so interesting because um, like f- for example, even yourself, you're a public figure, you know, you must have dealt with some backlash yeah. like, like bullying online um as well. oh yeah I, I get it every day myself scott that's yeah. the funny thing people don't it's good that you point that out because i don't think people realize that but i i get the same amount of abuse as what they do depending if i go on a tv show and come off it you gotta expect a lot of abuse you know it's the, mm. the haters are the only ones that comment if you look at stories and stuff on um, on news sites, if you look at the comment section, they're all people who just got nothing else to do apart from saying negative mm-hmm. negative things. And but you also you got to have the attitude. It's all about the mindset too. Is that if you're not getting talked about, if you're not getting these negative comments, then you're doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. Because you because if you're getting that kind of feedback, people are taking an interest in you. So. Yeah, people get depressed and they get down and stuff because they, they're getting trolled or they're getting bullied online. But the positive side to it is you must be doing something good because you're getting on their nerves. They're <laughs> sick of seeing you in the news. They're sick of seeing you doing well on Instagram or wherever it may be yeah. or, or on a TV show. So, yeah, I, I have been very good to try and help people out over the years and and react to them and, um, and try and... Uh, but it is changing so fast. And we, we do have the problems with the physical people still where they they hunt people out. Um, like I, some of them are very well known in the press. I could talk about like with Caprice, the supermodel. Yeah. Um, I helped her out maybe four or five years ago now. And she, she just used to go out with her children, two boys. And she had uh, some um, like teenagers shouting abuse at her and circling her with bicycles. And they knew who she was. She felt intimidated. So... So I jumped out there to try and help her out, give her some lessons, and we did some stuff online as well. And and um, she's a toughie. No one really messes with Caprice too much. But she handled it very sensibly. But I think it's more so the reality stars who come out from shows and they're not used to this instant fame, instant yeah. two, three million followers on Instagram, and then the masses of abuse that comes with it. And if you read all those comments, you are going to go mad. That's yeah. the, we've all been victim of that. You know, if I have to read all the stuff about me online, I'll go, you know, it'll get to me after a while. You, you got to, when I used to work with Michael, he used to say, you've got to build rhinoceros skin. You've got to have tough skin in this, in this business, otherwise you won't, uh, you won't survive it. But it's not so much as celebrities now, it's with everybody. Everybody's a victim of cyberbullying to some extent. It depends on how you look, you know, what gender you, you, you categorize yourself in and the way people view you. It's everybody's got, a yeah. victim of uh, bullying nowadays, unfortunately. Absolutely. So, like, who at the moment, like celebrity-wise, for this, who do you look after right now? Because um, I know I know you've done. Well, who have you looked after um, in the past and uh, help people out? Uh, people, people can Google and find them, but a lot of the Love Island um, girls mm. I've uh, tapped after. I, I guess most the most publicised one has been Megan Barton Hansen. Right, yeah. Since she came out of the house, sorry, out of the house, the, um, I used to say Big Brother, see, sort of off, the, off the island or whatever you want to call it, the uh, <laughs> the Love Island thing there. Yeah. So I've worked with her a lot and also training her for different TV shows and things like that has been really important. And um, 
So, um, yeah, there's been loads. Obviously, the, the one I'm most known for is obviously Michael Jackson, I guess. That's the... Yeah. Yes. We're going to touch so base me- on him in a this, in this sec. But, like, so, for example, I know it's different. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I'm going to put it out there. But, like, it's obviously, I know you're looking after loads of the, the ladies for this. But you, if you've been looking after the men, because, obviously, I might need you someday. You never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the, men, the men don't seem to get it so bad. Right. As, as the girls, that's one thing I've I've noticed. They, they don't get it, or well, they don't want to admit it. Maybe that mm. might be the thing. That they don't want to reach out. But have we ever had to do? I mean, just trying to think. If we've had to look after a male celebrity before. No, oh. I don't, only Michael Jackson, but I was in a professional role, so that was different. Yeah. But no, not with internet. I guess they just don't reach out because they're a bit more embarrassed, or they um, feel they can handle it. I suppose. Mm. Oh, that's, still, yeah. that's really strange because like i know you've i know the people you looked after but um just for listeners to know you know like is any of the guys you know because love island like you said it's such a big show and when you come off that show you it, it, it's literally gone you everyone knows you and everything in your world around uh, changes you know um yeah, and uh, yeah, but I, I just didn't know if, if you had guys. I might call you Matt. You never know in ten years exactly. time. Hey, I mean, any <laughs> help? They just give me a call. But Love Island's an interesting one because Big Brother. I was associated to a lot of people with Big Brother. Some of my best friends have been in Big Brother. Right. They they actually wanted me in it at one point, but it's it's that died off. No one saw this Love Island thing coming, and for for that one. You go in there and they come out and they're just, well, not all of them. A lot of them just fade away. You never see them again. But five or six of them are just literally like megastars, you know, and uh, and they just can't handle it. And they're looking at Instagram and they, they suddenly got two, three million followers. And they've gone in with like 30 or something, you know, it's, it's insane. And their life will never be the same again. So I remember Megan, she, she was portrayed in, in that house as something that she really is not. She's a nice girl, very sensitive and, and so on. So she came out. She's probably the most biggest success story of Love Island, I'd imagine. Yeah. And she had to adjust to everybody knowing her, wherever she goes, and to thousands of messages coming in per hour on her Instagram and, and watching what she puts out. Because whatever she put out, even on Instagram stories, it'll be in the media within seconds. They'll pick it up. They're watching her account at all times. And it's hard to deal with that. It's really hard to deal with that. Especially if you're a young female, and I'll tell you also, Scott. You know, I seen some of the stuff she receives, and they're pretty sad, graphic, horrible things that she get. She got sent, not just her, some of the other females too, right. from guys and and um, and so on, and from jealous girls and things. Really horrendous stuff, and it's totally uncalled for. And you can see why some people get suffer from depression. You can see what what why Caroline flat got so down and depressed and you know because it's you know i i, I was privileged to, to see these messages coming in and you're like wow you know you got to turn the comments off you got to do this you, you mustn't read any of it because if you don't read it it don't affect you no you could do public the public are different they said they, they they're keyboard warriors behind your back but when when you're out with out on the street they, they come up and they want your picture and have a selfie and stuff and they, they're really nice to you but Behind the computer is the worst ones, isn't it? Like they're the, mm. the ones you got to look out for. Is that is it like you know? Because it's just so easy, isn't it? Now, like take a photo, what, screenshot stuff, like whatever, like type. Like, so yeah. is it a lot more that way? Because you know, I know, like you know, before, like before social media, it used to just be letters and yeah, and stuff. Do, do the people still get them? Do you, do you know? Like, do they still get those? They, they, they're still letters. Uh, yeah, I was with a very well-known um, female TV star. She was famous. She's been famous for like 25 years now. And um, her address is not publicized, but they managed to track out, track down her address. And she, when I was at her house, she was opening up kind of strange mail from people. So it does happen still, yeah. But not so much. It's easier for people to have access to celebrities now via all the social media platforms. They know normally it's not an agent at the other end. It's actually individual. And even like the superstars, a lot of them are controlling their own Instagram accounts now. Yeah. They don't, they don't let the agents near it because yeah. they communicate with them all. But uh, we, we, we get it a lot. About a month before lockdown, we had 
uh, a a lot of actually made, made press actually I could talk about it. Lizzie Candy, who's um, she does a lot of TV presenters. She has two presenters for talk radio as well and yeah. regular on this morning and GMTV. What's GMTV? Good Morning Britain. Um, Lizzie, she's famous with lots of people. Like Simon Cowell's one of her best friends. He wrote the forward to her book and and um, she called up in a panic and her Instagram account got hacked and all of her celebrity mates were contacted and they were handing over personal details thinking it was Lizzie and it wasn't, it was a hacker. And uh, we, we had to take over the account and get hold of all of her friends and and um, and, and get their get their passwords back and, and so on. It was a it was a nightmare. But it's yeah, it's a whole different new world now compared to what it used to be when you just get a letter through a post or a threat on a phone call. Now they can get into your social media, they can even get your credit cards, they can get your contacts, they can ruin your friendships by sending messages because you think, I fell for it. It's a telling thing, Scott. I got a message from Lizzie saying, hey, Matt, I've lost your phone number. Can you send me a number? So sure, Lizzie's my number. And it wasn't her. It was uh, it was a hacker. And um, they managed to do that to a load of stars, you know, like Hollywood stars who she's friends with too. They all fell for it. Oh, so it's God. very sophisticated, clever stuff what's going on now. Hmm. I, I remember like when I was reading things or like Paris Hill or whatever she was like my son was stole my phone I've lost my phone and she's been like all these people must be fuming with her you know it's like just don't have my number you know because <laughs> she's just used yeah. that way but I just say it like oh like but it is risky though isn't it you know like um but some people like for phone number wise I really don't have that many it's just I just connect with people on social media really um, or email, right? Like, just I don't really have much numbers in my phone. No, case. that's the way it's going now. People don't really yeah. ring anymore. No, no, phones don't seem to ring anymore. It's all WhatsApp, iMessage, isn't it? Or social media. You're yeah. right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. So, Stays real. is that part of your thing as well? Like, you know, because obviously, I, I deal with hackers. Is is that? Do you cover that? Obviously, that as well. Do you? Yeah, we, we, we got the team, see, Scott, that we can step in and we've been there and done it at the highest level. And I've had to do it myself at times when when you've been under media scrutiny, you know, the tension's been really on you. So I know what they're going through. We have the IT people, we have the, the web people, we have access to Facebook and Instagram consultants. So I just help them out. So when they get in trouble, they reach out Um Stood in my bodyguard role, I guess, although that's not really officially what I do. And we just help them out. We have, we just take it on for them. And they're my friends that we've built up over the years, you know, because it's a shame. There isn't a one service that you can go to if you're getting hacked for Instagram. We can help you out apart from Instagram itself. And then you, you need to be able to get hold of them, which is very hard to do. Whereas, because for my martial arts business, we spend so much money with Instagram and Facebook, we can get them on the phone. And through the bodyguard inside of it, I know what they need to do, what they need to avoid, how to change their passwords often, and so on. And and it's it's important they do that. So, mm. yeah, we we do just like a a friendly thing for them. Really, we don't take any money for it or anything. We just help them out. Mm. I'm, a bit, I'm a bit soft like that. I know. I I'm, I'm quite happy. I, you're my show. I'm obviously we connected before, but oh, I'm happy to have Matt. My friend. Hopefully, he's going to be my friend, listeners. Hopefully, Matt's going to be. My Definitely. I might never know. I might need you in the future, but uh, we don't live far apart either, do we, Matt? So it's it's a local friend, which is quite nice. Um, Not far away. And we got the same PR company now too, aren't we? So we have got a connection there as well. Yeah, so we're, yeah. we're, we're connected in many Rebecca. ways. <laughs> She's um, a legend. She. She is. She is fabulous. I am so happy I've joined that team. And um, yeah, they're, they're all the amazing people under it. So uh, it's incredible. And I just, so I think obviously in this episode, I, I description, obviously we're going to talk about Michael Jackson. I think everyone by now, we were so eager to know because I, am I saying, was it 10 years of being his bodyguard? Was it about 10 years of yeah. doing that job? Um, what happened is, I was his friend first, Scott, and then um, then I ended up being his bodyguard. But between you... between like two thousand and two thousand and four, yeah, I was very active with him. So you'll see lots of stuff on YouTube and things. We had lots of events, but then, of course he had the allegations then. Yeah, and then the nation of Islam looked after him. So I became more of a friend of his after two thousand and four, and would meet up with his best friend 
uh, who's my best friend, to Mark Lester, who played the original Oliver Twist and Black Beauty, um, the lead guy in that when he was younger. He's the mm-hmm. same, same age as Michael. Michael introduced me to him. So from 2004 onwards, I would talk to Michael and see him more as a friend than a bodyguard. But the first four years or five years or so was very much in a protective role, as well as being his friend. I just thought it was, new, it was normal, to be fair, Scott. I think when you're young like that, it was just uh, just a famous friend who I was helping out. How did you guys meet? So, you wow, meet? all that publicity I talked about earlier on that I had, the, yes. the, 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 the TV shows, came to the attention of another famous guy, inter- international famous guy called Yuri Geller. And Yuri is a famous psychic in England. He's more famous, I suppose, well, known for bending his spoons with the power of his mind. He rubs them and they, they bend in his hand. And, and he's got these TV shows all around the world. And unbeknown to me, so Yuri reached out to me. He saw this publicity. He said, let's, let's do a video together. It's VHS back then. Let's do, uh, he'll do like positive mindset and I'll do the anti-bullying side to dis- distribute to schools for free. And then we became best friends. And then I didn't know his best friend was Michael Jackson. And <laughs> one night, uh, middle of the night, he called me up and said, I want you to come to my house. He, I can't tell you why. Um, it was a bit awkward with my other half trying to explain. I can't tell you why well, Yuri's called. I can't say where I'm going, why I'm going there, who's going to be there. <laughs> and I got there early hours of the morning, got in the living room, and uh, this frail guy walks up to me, bows to me, like in martial arts like you do. He says, oh, hi, uh, Matt Fidesz, I'm Michael Jackson. And shake, shakes my hand. I think, well, I know you, who you are. What the heck are you doing here? And how did this all come about? But they, it turns out they were best friends. And Yuri designed Michael's album cover for his last album, Invincible, for him. And um, it just went on from there, really. And, yeah, I just ended up part of that inner circle. And, yeah. and it was very privileged. Because you become the people you, you, you mix with. I was lucky I was mixing with, like, billionaires and successful people at such a young age. So I wasn't doing the nightclub thing and going out and getting drunk. I couldn't tell people what I'd be doing at weekends. They'd never believe me. I couldn't say, oh, I've been hanging out with Michael Jackson, Britney Spears, and Yuri Geller, and Dara Hannah. They think I'm completely mad. So it took a while until <laughs> they saw me and Michael out attending the war shows together and things so that they could get their head around it, you know, mm. and understand it. Um, I look back now and I think, yeah, I was very privileged. But back then, when, when you're 18 years old, you just don't really value it so much, I don't think. I just... I just saw it as my friend who was a bit famous who needed a bit of help and I had to keep it quiet. That's it, really. That was all yeah. it, it was to me. But looking back now, it's like a big fascination to everybody and I appreciate it a lot more. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, yeah, man, he's, he was well, a legend, isn't he? You know, he's, yeah, um, he stood. I mean, it's not a day that goes past I don't get asked about Mike and um, his music's on every day and there's, there's new programs being made about him all the time and and unfortunately, because he's dead and he can't defend himself, and he was the biggest target in the world, we're, we're always having to defend for him because he's not here to speak for himself anymore. And he, he's a, mm-hmm. he tried to make himself this enigma, this mystery, and that, that's backfired on him because people don't know if he's gay or if he's straight or if he's half man, half woman. But that's what Michael wanted. He wanted to create this mystery. He used to say to us he wanted to create the biggest... Uh, mystery on earth is what he wanted his life to be and that that he achieved that but unfortunately nearly 11 years on it's, it kind of backfired on him with that documentary last year because people did really not get to know the real michael you know and um they just thought he's like this clown figure but you don't get to be the biggest superstar in the world scott and a multi-billionaire with the biggest album in the world if you're a stupid guy that, that guy was intelligent and he he could manipulate the press with makeup Keeping everyone guessing, the face mask which everyone wears now bizarrely daily. Yeah, you know, he with that the sunglasses. He knew exactly how to manipulate the fresh and and on the back of that, he would get the best album deals. He would get the best TV slots, and he knew the value of the media. Yeah, and uh, it's just unfortunate. It just backfired like it has done. But I think people are seeing through a lot of that now, and uh, it's it's sad. It was last year, so I was to try and defend it, but it didn't take a lot to defend because these guys were making allegations that things took place in buildings that weren't even built yet for like five or six years. So I think that program will never be replayed again. And um, yeah, had he been alive, it, they, it would never have been come to come to be about anyway, you know. And 
Mm. It's sad, but he was the biggest target in the world, and he still is, even in death. He's the highest earning pop star. You know, so, I, did you watch the whole program, or was you like, was you? Oh well, if you did watch it, like all of it, did you? Was you fuming inside? Was you angry? Was you like disappointed in these people speaking? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to watch it, but I had no choice because I knew I was going to be asked about it. Like Becky would want me to watch it too, so I had to watch it. People wanted me to comment on the allegations before I watched it, which I couldn't do, so I watched it through. Mm-hmm. To me, I mean, obviously, I got to meet Wade Robson. He was he was around at times, and and um, he was the star witness in the 2000 trial, sticking up for Michael. Right. And um, in America, I believe if you get past seven, if you you don't if you commit perjury and you defend someone, and then you seven years retract it, seven years later, then you you don't go to jail. So the timing was very very obvious. The thing they missed out of the documentary is that the guys. I suing Michael for hundreds of millions of dollars. And had they put that in a documentary, then I think people would have turned it off or turned the channel over or took a different view on it. That's quite an important part. You know, they've got two guys here who defended Michael in 2005, mm-hmm. said that nothing happened. They're suing him for hundreds of millions of dollars, failed. Then they've appealed. And then they, they're making this TV program. Um, so that should have been included in the program, definitely. And of course, Michael couldn't defend himself. He's no longer here. So yeah, I was I was I was fuming. I was angry, and I also was angry that the public would actually buy into it. But it just came like a free fall for the media to write what they want about it. And then when things started to be proven to be untrue, as as the program was being dissected by Michael Jackson's estate and his fan base, were amazing. Yeah, that it was they started the media started to print it. So. I think originally it was four hours long. I think now it's like an hour and a half long or something because all the inaccuracies that are in it. And we made one too. It's on Amazon Prime called Chase the Truth, which rips holes in Wade and James's allegations. But, you know, Scott, we've been dealing with this with Michael ever since I've known him. People out for money are trying to, trying to sue him. And I think he's had over a thousand lawsuits in his life, if I remember rightly. It was a daily occurrence. We had people do anything to try and meet him. And, uh, and even like we're out and about shopping and he would let the odd child come through the crowd to have an autograph. But when you try and hand the child back to the parent, the parent was like, well, that's only been a few minutes. Can he have, can he have 10 minutes more with Michael? You know, they'd be very pushy. Yeah. And it was, it was our role to try and keep, it was the parents that were the problem, not the kids. They just <laughs> wanted the kids to be around him. They wanted, they wanted to go to Neverland. They wanted to be part of his life. And, it was never the children, and uh, honestly, my problem with Michael was was not children. It was women. He he just, he just didn't want to publicise that. He didn't want to let his fans down. He's been educated since he's five years old by his dad and record company to always promote that he's single and to not upset his fan base. So to to keep that mystery: is he gay? Is he straight? He he would never let let, him, let you know what's going on. I know he got married twice in the end. Yeah, um, but he that's the way he was trained. Don't let your fans down. You lose your fan base. They found that you had a girlfriend. You know that's that was always in his mind. So we want to keep that mystery going. So he he went on to marry Lisa Marie Presley, Alvis's daughter, and he had relationships with girls and uh, who I still stay in contact to to this day. But the media don't want to print that because it doesn't go along with the narrative of what they want him to to be like, which they're so far from the truth. It's unbelievable. Mm. Oh, it's it's just upsetting though. You know, it's just I I can see where you're coming from, like an angry point of view you know because it's just fris- like frustrating because they're not they just think of that of him innit? and then it's just like that's it I don't want to know nothing else it has to do with this that's it um, oh, you know yeah. what I mean it's like frustrating <laughs> jeez yeah, yeah. and the yeah. trouble is the more we spoke out the more attention you give it as well yeah. so I know a lot of his family didn't bother speaking out or his sister Janet I don't think she spoke out but if you speak out, you, you bring attention onto the subject, and then more people watch the program. So you can't really win. Mm. So at the time, like Becca May had offers for me to go on this morning and Good Morning Britain, but you bring in attention to the subject, you know. And it's if Michael was here at the time, he would have left it to the lawyers, unleashed a massive legal attack on him, proved him wrong because everything we did was filmed, Scott. Every, every everywhere we went was filmed. So we knew exactly who Michael was with, where he was. No one's getting past us. We know exactly 
who's visiting him as a hotel suite. So there's no children in my area getting near, near the guy. It was just, he was very cautious about that, you know, and um, the only people that were inside his room were his, were his girlfriends, you know, but basically that was it. And um, so all his staff that were in there for work meetings and stuff. So it's an impossibility. It just can't happen. And even at Neverland, you've got like 150 security staff. Michael can't just walk out of his house and walk around his home. He has to have security follow him because people parachute in yeah. and say they've done it by mistake to try and, to try and meet the guy. So yeah. it was just a lot of nonsense. And like the panic room is in Neverland. They said it was like a child's secret room. It's not. He, that was there when he bought the house. The guy's a multi-billionaire, the most famous man in the world. It's very normal to have a panic room. And so you push the door and you'd have stuff in there to keep him entertained for maybe several days until a problem was solved. And there was many times he had to go into that room because people would parachute in, they'd get on the ground, fire alarms would go off, and mm. the head of security in Neverland would tell him to go to the panic room. So it's not a secret room for child children, all this ridiculous stuff mm. that people make up. But it's, it's sad, really, because he was the biggest star, his biggest target, and uh, always will be. And what they should remember is his music and his dance and his creativity and all, all this nonsense that they drum up I think people have kind of seen through a lot of it now. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that's, that's the end of it now. They'll focus on the music and the, the guy was a nice guy. This is the problem is he's too nice. That's the issue. He was just so naive, so nice, so friendly, so loving, caring to everybody he met. And uh, that would backfire on him. You know, he would, he would want to help children who are dying of cancer. He would want to reach out. Even my mum, when she was dying of cancer, he would call her like every other day wherever he was in the world to try and keep her uh, positive and stuff. That's the kind mm. of guy you, you deal with, you know, he's a lovely man, very mm. sensitive person. So mm. yeah, he's, he's, he's greatly missed. It's a shame that his, his um, reputation has been tarnished by this, these crazy allegations. And then what, like, like, is it like a time, like, do you miss him quite often? Would you think? Um, as a person, because he's, because you don't like what I love about you, Matt, is that you're not thinking of him as a work or a job. It's the person, and you, you know, like you said, like he's a, such a lovely guy, and like, do you miss him? Like, oh, is it like every year? Do you celebrate his, not celebrate, but like, you know, on his death and things like that, or his birthday maybe? That like you do like a little celebration, um, to just remember the good times. Oh, he He's, he's an interesting one because a normal friend, you kind of grieve over them and then you maybe like celebrate them. Whereas Michael, you have to live with it every day because he's yeah. on the radio or he pops up on TV. You know, he's, he's like he's never really gone. I mean, I miss his phone calls and the pranks he used to play on me and uh, his <laughs> business advice and uh, the time we used to spend with him and yeah. stuff. Definitely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And the way he went was, was terrible. Mm -hmm. But... Um, He's like he's still around us all the time anyway. He's just uh, every every day his name pops up. He's he's around and he's, uh, his music will live on forever. I think there's some more albums to be released from one from one way or two. And there's going to be like a biopic. A bit like the Freddie Mercury one. Remember that big movie they did, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody? I understand they're doing one on Michael Jackson as well. So there's 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 a lot more to to happen but yeah as a friend i missed the guy i mean i was it's a big part of my life a huge part of my life yes but okay. you just had to learn to try and grieve that one so that so yeah when his anniversary comes around michael never really had celebrated his birthday much because he's, he was raised a jehovah witness and um he just liked to spend it with his with his children really and didn't make a big deal out of it but the yeah every year the fans do put posts up or i'll put a post up or something like that but yeah you you, you know he would want you to celebrate his music and look after his fans and his legacy and stuff. And he wouldn't want me to be responding to all of this criticism that he gets because Michael's attitude was always ignore it. It don't deserve my attention. And if he shines a light on it, it, it makes the problem bigger. So all the challenges he had to put over throughout his life when he was living, his advice to us was don't comment, don't speak, yeah, ignore it. But it got to a point where last year, Scott, we had no choice. We yeah. had to speak out. It was just getting silly, you know, just getting absolutely silly. You got imagine. two guys, you got a guy accusing him of being sexually molesting him on a train station that wasn't even built until the guy was a grown man. You know, it's just complete, utter nonsense, the whole thing. 
Well, yeah, I was watching the documentary, just putting a hole through the whole thing, right, right to the end. Um, but um, that's still ongoing now, I believe, with the estate. I think they're suing the broadcasters for a hundred million, and I think the, the Wade and James are still suing the estate for hundreds of millions as well. So that's still ongoing. But it's a shame the public didn't get to see that in the program. It needs to, it needed to be balanced, and it was balanced, in my view. Absolutely, Abs- I I can't agree with you more. And like now having you on, um, like I really connected you, and hopefully listeners have as well. Like connect you in the way, like you know, I how you really thought about him and how, yeah, it's just you, you touched me in the heart, Matt. If you, that's the kind of thing I want to say. He's a good uh, guy. He, he made a great yeah. effort to become a Michael Jackson Scott. So if yeah. we were in a room. He'd have normal jeans on, a t-shirt. He, he, he liked whiskey and wine and stuff like that. And he was swear and stuff. He'd be a normal guy. But if mm-hmm. we're going out, he said, right, I need an hour and a half to become Michael Jackson. He'll take himself into his room and he'd come out of all the makeup on, the fedora, the, the, his outfits and so on, the lipstick. And uh, and off we went. So he, he kind of made that enigma himself. Cause he knew it would create the, the publicity is what his fans would want. But behind closed doors, he had a deep voice. He was a normal guy. He, he was calling the shots. He was a businessman. He he got taught that ruthless business business side by his dad, Joe Joe Dad Jackson, and um, he had his soft side from his mum, Catherine, too. He was very sensitive. But uh, he he was a when he's on stage, the guy's an animal. I mean, it, just couldn't understand where that came from, and neither could he. I say to Michael, where did that? Where did that come from? He said, I don't know, just from above. I've got no idea. He just gets on stage. He's a different person again. And it's strange with him because we used to travel with him. And he's so shy. In a lift, he would turn and face the mirror and put his hands over his eyes so that the other people in the lift can't see him. Yeah. Because he's actually like, they don't look people in the eye. Yeah, half an hour later, he'll be on stage and he'll be dancing away to 80,000 people. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. It's two yeah. very different people. Yeah, what it's it's showbiz though, isn't it? Like on stage, you you gotta perform, you know. So, yeah, you can't just be the chill guy. You gotta just go crazy on stage, right? And I, but a lot of people do say that though. Like you know, Beyonce, she turns into Sasha Fierce when she's on stage, and you know they just got this other person that takes over when they're on performing. Um, you know, so it's quite cool. It's good. Yeah, um, yeah, he was just totally different. Yeah, and I, I think how, do you know the good thing with me? I got to know him before I saw him and stood next to him on stage. Had I seen him on stage before, was maybe you'd have been a bit more in awe of the guy. But to me, he was just Mike. And when I saw the stage bit, that came later on in our friendship, you know, when he when I saw him performing. It was just two two guys. You couldn't even identify him as the same man. And uh, yeah, just blow us away, really, on stage. It's a shame I didn't see more of that. I only saw, I think, three shows that he did. And um, because the last 10 years of his life, he needed three shows from what I can remember, three or four. And they're like charity one off events. He didn't do a tour in my era. He finished doing that in 97, 98, in a history tour. Mm. But it was a good education for me. I mean, he taught me a lot. He taught me a franchise. He taught me how to think big and uh, anything's possible and not to look at, not paying attention to negativity and to always give back and then you receive more. You know, that was his message as well. And, uh, yeah, he's just a cool guy. He's just a good guy to hang around with. And, and um, as is your, as your mate, basically. Mm. Brilliant. Very good mate to have, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, I tell you, if, I, if, I get someone, if I couldn't get someone to return my phone call for my business, I used to get Michael to do it for me. And they used to call him back for in seconds, you know. He didn't get anyone on the phone. <laughs> anyone could speak to Michael Jackson. You know, was, yeah. I used to ring him and say, I can't get this. I remember some, one time, it's very very silly. I was trying to get leaflets out in a school in um, North Devon, and I couldn't I couldn't succeed getting hold of the head teacher. He wouldn't return in my call. Oh. So I got Michael to ring him. And then the guy could believe it. You know, so oh, any chance it's like, it's like a self defense seminar I was putting on. And he, he called Michael back within minutes, you know, and uh and uh, he couldn't believe it. And then the, the the guy to this day he's like, you know, I can't believe I spoke to Michael Jackson and and he, he gave my leaflet set the next day to promote my self-defense thing I was doing in, in the town. But no, he, he was a good guy. He would always help out his friends and, and we would do anything for him. I never took any money from him too. I did it all for free. You know, that was, I think that's what made it work, Scott, is that he didn't look at me and think, oh, Matt's trying to make money from me. I did everything for him for free. He actually cost me money, in fact. 
because I had my right. staff work for him as well. Right. So uh, right. I had my business it was a huge success. So I didn't really need his money, and uh, mm. that that worked out well. Yeah. But other than that, I've had a normal life. <laughs> well, I. I, I don't, I'm going to just touch on this one topic because I think it's very important before um, I let you go. And um, obviously, I follow you on Instagram and any listeners out there, I'm going to check all your socials on there to check Matt out because he's definitely worth a follow. And one thing you posted, and it's just the hype of everything right now, was um, the George yeah. Floyd's, um, um, obviously, the what's happened with him. And um, you did a very touching um, state... Uh, like a photo, I, I like to say photo, but you know, a, a, a status really about this. And um, I just want you, before you go, just to kind of just touch with us on this and kind of like, you know, why did you kind of want to decide to do it? Do you think you, you got such a big platform? Do, is you wanted to do it or? Um, well, we started, we started getting messages from, from like, from a martial arts point of view. Is this a move? Is this something that is taught as a, like a restraint? Right. Or, a bodyguard point of view is, is this a restraint is this any way justifiable at all i didn't want to get involved with the media side of it scott because um i just felt you jumping on the kind of a bandwagon there that's very serious yeah but i reviewed the footage properly when they released the full the full footage i wanted to see the whole lot because you can you can capture one bit and not not see everything so i saw everything in context and um yeah the guy what the, what the police officer was doing was was basically well, he murdered him. There's no doubt about it. You don't go and put your knee on someone's neck. There's no martial arts move or restraint or bodyguard justification for that at all. Mm. Even if he was threatening your life, you know, with knives and stuff. I mean, these guys have got guns out there in America. They, they sold different to the UK. And, um, and I know that from bodyguarding because the bodyguards, when they come to England with Michael Jackson, they, they didn't know what to do because their guns got took off at the airport. Right. And it's just down to me for advice. So you really, you got to know your restraint martial arts skills. But you have chokeholds in martial arts where you tap out. So they tap on your shoulder and you release when they feel it's getting a bit tight. But you, there's no such thing as a knee on someone's neck. I mean, that's just absolutely ridiculous and bizarre. I mean, the guy, and, and it's sad, isn't it? Because you can hear him clearly saying, I can't breathe. And yes. you you got to recognize it. Even if you feel he's lying, you've got to give him the benefit of the doubt. And there's so many more things that, the officer could have done done that. Mm-hmm. So if he says he can't breathe, he didn't believe him. That's okay. Just bring your knee back to the shoulder. Plus there's two or three other police officers there watching on, or I believe been arrested as well. They, they could have got involved. There was no need to suffocate the guy or whatever happened, put all that pressure on his neck until he died. I mean, there's so many ways he could have restrained him, which they would have been trained in. Uh, three or four cops could have easily just sat on the guy. You know, handcuffed. There was no need to put your knee on his neck. So for me, from a martial arts point of view, I just wanted to clear up that there, there is no move like that. It's just right. there's no explanation for it. There's no justification for it at all. He murdered the guy, and mm-hmm. even if he did it by mistake and he he heard him say, "I can't breathe," he should have used his common sense and brought his knee back to the shoulder. Maybe asked for a bit more assistance from the other officers to restrain him, but. Not around your neck with your knee. I mean, to kill someone doing that takes a lot of pressure, Scott, too. You'd be surprised. Your body, your human body can put up an awful lot. You can see with like UFC fighters and MMA with Conor McGregor, they put the body puts up a lot. To, to kill someone like that, there, a, there must have been a lot of pressure put on. I mean, that guy would have suffered terrible, absolutely terrible. It? I just hope it will make a difference. It won't happen again. And um, these police get a bit more control put on them. Yeah. Okay. I, I've, I've seen I've seen it before. I mean, my wife's from South Africa, and I've been out there, and I've seen the police out there, and they're and they're very corrupt, um, and they it's just time definitely for the the whole world to have a change in policing and law enforcement. And it's um, in America, it's, it was shocking to see in this like this day and age that happening, isn't it? Really, it's just sad, really sad. But uh, yeah, it would, it would have been wrong for me to ignore it. I had to, as a public figure who's well known for the martial arts and the bodyguard side of the thing, I just found mm-hmm. easy to address it mm-hmm. from my point of view. And then, and um, yeah, I just hope the guy gets what he deserves. And uh, um, but you know, with powerful lawyers and stuff these days, he, I wouldn't be surprised. Even the guy who killed Michael Jackson, he got done for manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter. He did got sentenced to four years, just did two years, and got out. Mm. Um, so 
you don't know. You got you got to prove that was intended murder for a start. Yeah. With, with intent, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard. And if he gets manslaughter, the guy could be out within two years. Oh, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be him. He, no security is going to keep that guy safe or any any of those officers. You know. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's well, sad. It, it is a lot of negativity in the world at the moment. That's, that's a sad thing. It is. I think. Um... Yeah, I was devastated. You, uh, yeah, I was. I don't want to touch too much on it, but I know your post. Um, obviously, it, it was a big post, and I just wanted to just touch on that quickly with you. Um, but yes, you, obviously, I could imagine how probably me- how many messages you may have about yeah. how what was done, and was that like kind of, of a regular move kind of thing? You know how to do things, but absolutely not. It ain't, so no. No, definitely not. No, that guy deserves to spend the rest of his life in prison. And I don't say that very lightly normally on anything I do, but wow. you can't argue with the footage. That's a good thing about it nowadays. Everyone's got body cam on them and, and footage and people recording with their phones, so it's going to heighten up, you know. So now the, the years ago, you just had paparazzi. Now everybody's a paparazzi because they got their phones up high. So wow. everyone's in their pictures into newspapers and things. It's not just the paparazzi was dying out. That's gone. Almost. <laughs> oh, no. Now it's the public chasing you down with phones. I know, exactly. But, um, well, hey, well, it was lovely to get you on the show. It was um, great to speak to you. And um, thanks for sharing so much with me. I was so interested to get you on, Matt, honestly. I've never had a guest like you before. Oh, and maybe I should go on the hunt for more because it was so interesting on your story and what you do. Um, it's quite incredible. So... Uh, thank you so much for coming on and enjoy the rest of your day. And you too. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. You are welcome. Take care, Matt. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for listening to the Scott McGlynn Show podcast. Make sure you tweet us at Scott McGlynn and let us know what you learned or enjoyed from the show today. And make sure you subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify and iHeartRadio.